As someone who's been playing Pikmin since the GameCube era, it's been pretty exciting seeing this franchise finally being played and discussed by a broader gaming demographic. However, the one thing that still continues to get largely ignored is the various competitive modes we've seen since Pikmin 2. Seriously, people will talk about the story, the enemies, the characters, but when's the last time you heard someone make something more than just a passing reference to one of the versus modes in these games? Being that Pikmin is an RTS game at its core, and RTS games are commonly renowned for their head-to-head -head multiplayer, the inclusion of a head-to-head -head mode in Pikmin seems like a no-brainer. And even fans aside, it's crazy how overlooked this aspect of the series is by Nintendo themselves, because I think there's a lot of untapped potential here. Well, I'm gonna be your personal guide through each and every versus mode we've seen thus far, because I love these modes. I play them all the time, my friends, and there's a lot to talk about. Like, so much that all these versus modes were originally scripted as a single video, until I realized it was roughly 30 pages long. So instead, we'll be taking it one game at a time. Hey, I'm Psylocke Hawk, and this is an in-depth look at the two-player battle mode in Pikmin 2. Pikmin 2 was not only the first game to have two-player co-op, but also two-player versus. Simply referred to as two-player battle, we have Olimar as player 1, and Louie as player 2, pitted against each other in one of 10 maps. Olimar is in control of Red Pikmin, and Louie Blues. This is the only time in the mainline series Red Pikmin do not have their 1.5x damage multiplier, as they needed to be nerfed, so that way the player with Blues isn't at an immediate disadvantage. Even though Reds and Blues have the same damage output here, they are still immune to fire and water attacks respectively. There are no fire geysers or bodies of water, so this can only be seen when engaging with a fiery or watery blowhog. The main objective of the mode is to secure four yellow marbles back to your onion, of which there are exactly seven in every layout. Despite resembling the treasure crystallized telekinesis from the story mode, which normally takes ten Pikmin to carry, the variant in two-player battle can be carried with a single Pikmin, likely so you can still win even if you only have one Pikmin remaining. They're all partially buried, and not until recently did I know there's a small chance for them to spawn shearwigs whenever you unearth them. So if you leave a bunch of Pikmin on a marble, just to come back to see a full dug up marble with no Pikmin in sight? Well, that's what happened. Another way to win is if you steal your opponent's colored marble from their base and bring it back to yours. It essentially provides a makeshift captured off flag element, and it's a lot of fun stealing your opponent's marble from right under their nose while they're distracted with something else. More uncommon ways to win is if the other player loses every last one of their Pikmin, resulting in a Pikmin extinction, or if they take too much damage, resulting in a player down. While still uncommon, you take considerably more damage from enemies in 1 and 2 than you do in 3 or 4, which my friend was very much unaware of when we played recently recently and was also extremely funny. You lost? Wait, can you die? <laughs> you start with a default of 10 Pikmin, which can be adjusted from 5 to 50 before the match starts. And much like you'd expect, defeating enemies and returning their corpse will reward you with more Pikmin you can pluck to add to your squad. The restriction of only allowing 100 Pikmin out at a time is likewise seen in this mode, albeit that 100 is split between both players, allowing Almer and Louie to have a max of 50 Pikmin each. Something I want to address, because I totally got this wrong during the scripting process, is that if you already have 50 Pikmin out, and then bring back an enemy corpse, the Pikmin you would have got, do not get added to your reserves. In Pikmin 3's bingo, if you have 50 Pikmin and then lose some, any additional Pikmin you have in your onion will automatically sprout out to keep your count at 50. It does not work like that in 2, so don't even bother returning corpse if you're already at your max Pikmin count when playing 2 player battle. PvE is basically the bread and butter of Pikmin, but given this is a versus mode, can Pikmin attack opponent Pikmin? Well, it'd be kinda silly if they couldn't. <laughs> Pikmin battles are always super hectic and really entertaining to watch, for both 2 and 3. Although this is how it works in 2 since it's a bit different in 3. When a Pikmin is in range of enemy Pikmin, it will run towards it and engage combat with it. In 2, Pikmin remain stationary while fighting, and will only take on one Pikmin at a time. This seems limiting, and I suppose it kind of is. But as you'll see when we eventually get to Pikmin 3, this design choice has a lot more advantages than you'd think. Initiating a fight against enemy Pikmin is the best way to stop your opponent from carrying something back, since if two opposing Pikmin are close enough, they'll start fighting even if that means dropping what they were currently doing. Your Pikmin can also attack the opposing captain. This doesn't do damage in Pikmin 2, although it will prevent your opponent from performing certain actions. As is standard for Pikmin games, Flower Pikmin are no more efficient in combat than Leaf Pikmin, albeit Pikmin charge of a spicy spray will have an advantage in combat, a fairly significant one in fact. You throw a single spicy charge Pikmin and it'll just like annihilate an entire squad. Speaking of sprays, you start with too spicy and too bitter at the start of every game, with the exception of Warpath where 
where you only start with one of each. Spicy Spray does exactly what you'd expect. It makes Pikmin super powerful and fast. Bitter Spray will petrify enemies as it does in story or mission modes. Do keep in mind that defeating enemies when petrified will not allow you to retrieve their corpse. In addition, Exclusive the Versus mode will plant any enemy Pikmin the spray comes in contact with. This can be a great stalling tactic as it can immediately stop your opponent from retrieving an item under proper use. Any planted Pikmin can be plucked, although they will reemerge on their own if you wait long enough. Additional sprays have a chance of spawning inside the various eggs you'll find throughout the map, and it's highly recommended you seek these out since proper use of sprays are essentially the meta of 2's battle mode. The other way to obtain more sprays is through the item roulette. Throughout the match, cherries will randomly spawn in various areas. If you return a cherry back to your onion, you will get one of 12 items. Here's the list. You got a plus 5, which will sprout 5 Pikmin at your onion, plus 10, which is the same deal except with 10 Pikmin, flower, which will bloom all your unburied Pikmin into flowers, even ones not currently with you, which is a much better item than you may think because unlike 3 and 4, the speed difference between a leaf and a flower Pikmin is substantial in 2. Not to mention, every yellow marble needs to be dug up, which flower Pikmin will likewise do faster. So remember to break open those eggs for nectar too. The ghost makes you and your Pikmin invisible to your opponent for a full minute, although do keep in mind you will still be fully visible to enemies. You got your spicy and bitter spray items that give you an additional spicy or bitter respectively. The marble return will send your colored marble back to your base from anywhere on the map. I recently played with someone who had never played the two-player battle before, and as such was completely unaware of this item. His reaction to it when he thought he was about to win was priceless. Oh shit, I no, what, what? <laughs> hey Jordan? Explain. <laughs> the boulder item will drop boulders on an opponent, killing any Pikmin it hits. The volatile Dweevil will drop one of those kamikaze spiders carrying a bomb on your opponent. And the three remaining items, the swooping snitch bug, the withering blowhog, and the fiery slash watery blowhog will spawn one of said enemies at your opponent's base. These enemies can be a huge time sink to your opponent, and they will not be able to carry back the corpse if they do happen to kill it. If you're sent any of these, in some scenarios, it's actually just better to ignore them, because spawned enemies will eventually disappear over time. There are also sprites for three more items that go unused. The three icons depict a spotty bull bear, an antenna beetle, and a random blue weevil that, much like the blowhog item, would have likely spawned a fiery or watery spider depending on which player used it. I can imagine they weren't added because three of the twelve items already spawned an enemy at the opponent's base. And also, a bull bear spawn is just brutal. Like, even for Pikmin 2. There's ten different stages to play on, all of which having their own defined themes and enemies. They're all based on the cave theme seen in the main game, but despite that, they do a pretty good job making them all feel distinct since many of them are built around a specific gimmick. Battlefield is your rudimentary first map sort of deal. Pretty small, but not tiny, and populated by small enemies. Warpath actually is tiny, probably why it's the only map where you do not start with two of each spray. Most of the time when you play this map, your base will practically be touching the base of your opponent, which makes the meta of Warpath super quick rounds that are more focused on the player marbles opposed to the yellow ones. Carpet Plane is your first really sizey stage. You got big open areas, and your biggest hazard you'll be dealing with on this one is the puffy blowhogs pushing around your Pikmin. It can be easy to get lost if you're not paying attention on this one. Angle Maze, as the name would imply, is a maze of tight square hallways. Big Bulborbs and even a boss can spawn on this one, making it significantly more dangerous than the previous three. Also, if you're as curious as I was to see what happens when you defeat it, here it is. <laughs> A swarm of little shrimp guys that scare the f out of your Pikmin. The devs of Pikmin 2 are literally evil. Colosseum is a snowy map with tons of high elevated platforms and paths, but more notably, enemies everywhere. I'm talking like super densely packed baddies. This is something I really miss from the older Pikmin games that you basically don't see anymore. Likely because without a swarm function, it could be really hard to deal with this many enemies all tightly concentrated. Although it seems even Nintendo forgot how much of the meta of 1 and 2 were defined by swarm, as the recent ports prioritize your right stick being used for the camera opposed to your dedicated swarm analog. Using the right stick as a camera was not a foreign concept even as early as Pikmin 1's release, but they still deliberately chose to use it for swarm instead. Just saying. Rusty Gulch is a level that uses those copper hallways over a bottomless void. There are tons of routes, but the lack of cave walls make it harder to get lost. Plus, this stage has the Pikmin community's most hated enemy, the Gatling Roink. Brawl Yard is an open garden map that is pretty big, yet with simple layouts. Many of the marbles are inside enemies, which makes ignoring the yellow marbles and instead stealing your opponents a tempting strat. Although you'll have to get your Pikmin past those dreaded cannon beetles that shoot the homing boulders. Tile Lands is one of those tiled bathroom stages of open square rooms and several narrow passageways connecting them. Loadouts are a lot smaller on this one than you'd expect. Dim Labyrinth is the only stage here that is always randomly generated. More on that in a bit, but basically this is a super dark sprawling cave. The level is defined by literally everyone's favorite 
favorite enemy, breadbugs. There's a handful of them, and in good old breadbug fashion, they will steal anything they could get their dirty little mugs on and then drag it back to their sex dungeon. This includes the player marbles, which you can actually use to your advantage. Because if a breadbug steals your marble, it can't be stolen by your opponent unless they kill the breadbug that buried it, which will likewise unearth anything else that particular breadbug has stolen. One thing I like about this map is that it always feels like it's player 1 versus player 2 versus team 3, the breadbugs. Little bastards. The final map, Hostile Territory, is very appropriately named as you'll be dealing with those balloon guys that throw bombs down, tons of anode beetles, and electrical wires. Friendly reminder that electricity is an insta-kill in Pikmin 2. <laughs> Basically, if you're going to lose on a map due to Pikmin Extinction, it's gonna be this one. Also, not until recently did I have any idea you can literally pick up and throw these bombs. What? I thought the captain using bombs opposed to the Pikmin was an idea started in 4, but no, Pikmin 2 did it first. In fact, if you want to master this map, learning to properly navigate around and use these bombs is key, since they can be used to kill enemies, destroy those electrical wires, and kill opponent Pikmin. That's all 10 battle maps in Pikmin 2, and honestly, I like them. There are a few that really stand out, but conversely, I don't dislike any of them. I think it was a smart choice to use the cave themes in the story mode as the basis as the versus maps, because I think it aids the variety. When people say they don't like the cave, in 2, I totally get it. But at the same time, I think there is a lot more level variety than people give it credit for. And two-player battle is proof of that. I mean, of course you got your token caves we saw, but you also have wide open grassy fields, tiled shower rooms, big old sandy labyrinths of metal dividers, those weird-ass floating rustic hallways complete with colorful cork floors, some igloo sh built around its high elevation platforms, and my personal favorite theming are the carpeted playrooms with blocks and toys everywhere. And as much as I love the above-ground stuff, for the purposes of multiple maps via a versus mode, I think the cave variety is more interesting than just nature. A cave theme unfortunately not present is a kitchen table full of plates and bread bugs, but the variety they do have is still pretty good. But what really seals the deal is how they're generated. For the longest time, I just assumed the levels use the same exact cave generation as the main game. And they can, but it's a bit more complicated than that. So every single stage has three pre-made layouts and will choose between when selecting a stage. That is, with the exceptions of Carpet Plain, which only has two fixed stages, Dim Labyrinth, which will always have a random layout every Every single time, in Brawl Yard, which does have three pre-made layouts, but also has a small chance to instead randomly generate a map. The three layouts of each stage are significantly different in most cases, which is why all my life, I just assumed they were all randomly generated. In Angle Maze, for example, you do got a layout that lives up to its name of being an angular maze, but then there's also a layout that's basically just a boss chamber of two bases on the opposite sides of the chamber. Because of how drastic many of the changes can be, you essentially have 26 defined stages all of which you can manually choose by holding the C-Stick up for Layout 1, right for Layout 2, and down for Layout 3. Even cooler than that is that if you hold left, it will force a random generation. So you can get a truly randomly generated stage using anything. Dumb decision to hide that feature aside, this is a really cool addition. Because of the random nature of, well, random generation, not every random layout is going to be balanced. So if you want a stage that won't ever be super one-sided. You can stick with the preset layouts, but the option to randomly generate a map anyways is super welcome and adds a lot of replay value to the versus mode in 2. Just seeing it generate the stupidest sh** you've ever seen is fun in its own right, like here where it spawned four consecutive rows of bridge hallways. Even though my friends and I that frequent the bingo battles in 3 still think its iteration of versus has the edge. Spoilers for the next video I suppose. We were all impressed with how well 2's versus holds up. All of the maps feel more distinct than you would think and genuinely provide some good variety. The rules are easy to understand with a pinch of randomness in the form of items that make rounds exciting, but still creates an experience that has a high skill ceiling. And much like many of the other totally unnecessary but welcome design flourishes seen throughout Pikmin 2, you know, things like all the captains having different swarm and whistle sounds, or being able to manually control a flint beetle or bulb orb on the menu, two-player battle likewise has a lot of little pinches of personality that makes it clear a lot of love was put into this mode as well. Like these faces on the menu that are so funny they've become a meme. Basically you got Oliver and Louie's face on the top there that will change depending on what the current score is between the players, with the face of the winning player getting more and more snarky, and the face of the losing player getting more and more pissed. Or the sound design itself. If player 1 is about to win, Pikmin will chant O-Ri-Ma in the left speaker. Almer's name in Japanese. And if player 2 is about to win, they will chant Rui in the right speaker. 
Louie's name in Japanese. I think if a newer fan plays it now, the biggest hurdle for them will be getting a handle on the controls. A lot has changed in that department over the years. My friends I play 3 with, that did not grow up with the games on GameCube like I did, still prefer the pointer and lock-on stuff of 3. Just getting acquainted with the differences of the older games compared to the newer ones can be a hurdle in of itself, which is why I was surprised I even enjoyed the verses in 2 at all. But if the differences in controls and mechanics aren't a hurdle for you, I would recommend giving that 2-player battle a try, because I genuinely think it holds up. That's all I have to say about 2-player battle, but I felt obligated to mention something that was bothering me the whole time I was doing research for this video. So if you don't want to hear me rant, just click off now. Firstly, I just want to say I love the Pikmin wiki. It's been heavily used in the making of my recent Pikmin videos on this channel. I still like to test things for myself before talking about it, because there will be the odd factoid every now and then that is incorrect. But that's pretty rare, and it's otherwise a great resource. Furthermore, I think, or at least I would hope, we can all agree that the best wikis are ones that are impartial. If I'm visiting a wiki, I am doing so because I probably want to educate myself with the raw facts and data. If I want to hear someone's opinion on something, I'll go to the many media sharing websites like Reddit, Twitter, or YouTube. The Pikmin wiki is almost always free of bias injections, as a good wiki should be, which is why the indirect jabs at 2's expense I kept running into was really jarring. Like, check out the end of this overview for Angled Maze, for example. The only two types of floors in this arena's grammatical error, sand and snow, have no smooth transition between them. This was actually edited further because the original edit just flat out stated there was no transition between snow and sand, which is factually false. That was edited to the current revision where it says there is no smooth transition between them. Beyond the fact that information is not significant enough to make sure it's included in the initial synopsis of a map, that statement is highly subjective. Like, don't get me wrong, this is a quick transition, but to say it isn't smooth is super debatable. Something this subjective should not be stated as fact on a wiki that some will use as a factual data resource, especially when the original outline used to read, the level's look is made up of sandy floors and concrete walls. When selected, this level shuffles between three different arenas, a maze arena which gives the stage its name, an arena with a large circular room containing a raging long legs, and a square pit arena which is shaped in a downward spiral. There are no environmental hazards in any of the three arenas. Pretty good overview. Then some guy removed all of that only leaving the no hazards thing and edited in this. The level shuffles a lot, you mean the average amount? Sometimes making you fight a raging long legs if you play in the level of the center arena. There are two types of floors here, sand and snow, and there is no transition between them. Why did this dude believe people knowing about a transition between sand and snow was more important than all that sh the other guy wrote? I didn't even mention the first part of the sentence either. The only two types of floors in this arena. One, that's not even true. There are small portions of stone that generate in certain units. Small or not, I think it's weird to pretend it doesn't count when it audibly makes different sounds when you walk over it. <laughs> But even if we're not counting that for whatever vague reason, two floor types, not textures, but types, for a versus map is pretty much the standard for not only Pikmin 2, but also Pikmin 3. So bias sounding diction aside, using the word only in this context as if it's a rare case doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But yeah, there were a handful of things like this. And each and every time it was always edited by the same guy. Like this one, after describing how Brawl Yard has a small chance of being randomly generated. All other stages have three predefined layouts and nothing else. Else. Again, why is the standard for both Pikmin 2 and 3 being treated like it's not good enough? Plus, what about the fact that every stage can have a random generation? That's a bit more than nothing, wouldn't you say? Even the stuff this guy was editing outside the battle mode articles have a tint of prejudice to it. In Pikmin 2, the first time in a save game the player uses a spray will trigger a cutscene, but the spray's duration counter will continue to go down during it, meaning the player will have less time to enjoy the spray with, that is very oddly worded, after the cutscene is over. Testing this for myself, this seems to be factually incorrect from what I can tell. I held onto this scene for a very long time, and it did not seem to affect the duration afterwards. By the way, if you're curious, a spicy potion lasts around 40-ish seconds in Pikmin 2. But then my guy continues. In Pikmin 3, this has been fixed, and that the timer only starts going down when the cutscene is finished or skipped. What do you mean fixed? Pikmin 3 is a completely different game, made in a completely different engine, for a completely different console, nine years after Pikmin 2. As far as I know, Pikmin 3 was not built off the same code as 2. The word fixed is not applicable in this context. I don't mean to harp on this, but it was constant. I mean, f**k. 
I was running into things this guy edited on other wikis. Even little things, like making sure to include a link to redirect you to Pikmin 3's battle mode at the top of the page for Pikmin 2's. Or saying Pikmin 2's versus is very similar to 3's. You mean the one that came out first? You don't say. Listen, I get you're such a huge fan of the third installment. You go out of your way to show people how much foliage there is. That's unironically what his page says. And I love Pikmin 3 as well. But again, there is value in a wiki being impartial. Especially one as professionally presented as the Pikmin wiki. Everyone's got their opinions, and obviously I'm very opinionated myself. That's no secret. But when it comes to a resource people are going to refer to for learning, how you or I feel about X or Y thing is not as important as unbiased information. People can make their own observations and judgments themselves. Flexing how a game doesn't have a glitch which would be insinuated unless stated otherwise. Or something trivial, like how you don't think a transition between sand and snow is smooth enough, shows bias that should be detached from entries you write on a site to share facts and data. Again, I love the Pikmin wiki, so I definitely don't want this to come across as an attack on the site. Hell, I don't even want this to come across as an attack on the dude making these edits. To be honest, this is more funny than anything, so please don't harass the dude over some edits they made to a wiki. But I did feel obligated to say something, not just because it was rubbing me the wrong way, but to also hopefully prevent bias from the wiki's future. All that aside, I hope this overview piqued your interest in the many versus modes in these games, because next time we're going to give an in-depth look on the one in Pikmin 3. Until then, thanks for watching this one on Pikmin 2, and give it a try if you haven't. See ya! Hey, thanks for watching. I'd like to give a special thanks to patrons such as Amanda Guth, David Marchese, Dave Pacheco, Drew Kellenberger, Evan Halbert, Gameplayer1500, Ian, Ken Zetian, Victoria Mars, Ryan Batter, Some Crazy Idiot, Verzi Edits, and Woodling. Again, thank you so much for watching, and until the Pikmin 3 vs. video, have a good one.